Good evening, brethren. It is good to be with you all this evening. We conclude this evening our preaching series through the book of 1 John. My only concern is, I've seen a lot of tired-looking faces this evening, a lot of babies with a lot of energy, which means a lot of tired parents. Uh, and the plan is for me to read 1 John to you. So uh, just try to keep the snoring down if you would, not to interrupt too much. I'll try to make it something that is engaging. But we're going to wrap up this evening by considering the letter again, just in general. And then what I like to do, and the reason I think this is so important, not just because Paul said give attention to the public reading of Scripture, but also because we really, it's good for us to hear the message as they would have heard it. So let's set the stage to begin. Um, the author of 1 John, strangely enough, was John, brother of James, the son of Zebedee. We talked about the external proofs for that. The author himself identifies himself in many ways, but we have Polycarp, actually one of the disciples of John, who attested to the fact that John was the author. And we have Clement of Rome, first century author, who quoted from 1 John and attributed it to John, the son of Zebedee. So not a lot of argument about that. Probably written A.D. 90 from Ephesus, and most of that comes from secular history and tradition. Um, Brother Gus Nichols put forward that he liked that date of A.D. 90 because there really isn't any mention of any persecution in this letter, and that didn't begin with the Emperor Domitian until uh, late, mid, or early to middle 90s. So that's why he thought 90 A.D. was a good date. From Ephesus, John, again, historical um, records tell us that in general, that's where he was until he was sent into uh, exile on the island of Patmos, which is just off the shore from Ephesus. Um, written to Christians in the face of that second heresy, Gnosticism. So uh, I guess I should stop. 90 AD. Okay, When did Jesus die, brethren? So we're a long ways away from that, aren't we? We're a generation and a half away from that. And John is writing to Christians like he did with his gospel to help them. And in this letter, in the face of that second heresy, not dealing with Judaizing teachers, but dealing with those who wanted to mix Greek philosophy and change Christianity to fit Greek philosophy. Remember, their main issue was that light and dark, spirit and flesh were completely separate. That which is flesh is wicked and evil and debased. That which is spirit is good and pure and holy, and never the twain shall meet. So the idea of God, the Word, coming in the flesh, they couldn't deal with that because then you have that which is perfect coming and becoming defiled and, and they couldn't work with it. So that gave rise to those three main schools, you remember, of the Gnostics. There were, first of all, the Docetics. Remember the Docetics said that Jesus didn't really come in the flesh. It just seemed like he was in the flesh, that he wasn't really physical, it just looked like it. That's why John emphasizes a spear coming in and water and blood coming out and we handled him, we touched him, uh, we saw him, we're telling you these things. There were the Corinthians. The Corinthians said that the, the Christ spirit just piggybacked off this man, Jesus, and that when Jesus the man was baptized, that's when the spirit, the Christ spirit came upon him and when Jesus was on the cross and said, Father, I give my spirit unto you, that's when the Christ spirit left him. Because again, they're, they're trying to find a middle ground because they can't accept the simple truth that God put on flesh and dwelt with us, suffered and died for us, but arose. The last group were the Ebionites, the poor ones, and they simply denied the deity of Christ. They said he was just a man. So that's what's plaguing the church of the first century. That's why the major themes that we saw and took note of in 1 John, the first and foremost is Jesus did come in the flesh. 
God did come and put on flesh and tabernacle tent with us. And you remember he's going to say, and those who don't hold this doctrine, they are antichrist. They are liars. Then he talked about how the fact he's just reinforcing Christians because with most false doctrine, it comes in and says, I'm not here to tell you something different. I'm here to tell you something you didn't understand. You misunderstood. You don't know the truth. Let me explain the truth to you. That's why much of John's letter is, is exemplified by, wait a minute, you know the truth. You're Christians. Remember that whole section in that song. I'm not writing to you because you didn't know. I'm writing to you because you already know. And I'm just telling you, you know. We have that anointing, that information that we've received from God. And the last one, I'll jump down one, and you need to abide and hold on to that truth. Don't be carried away with this false teaching. Division in a church caused by heresy, caused by false teachers and false teaching, it always causes a lack of love. The church divides amongst itself. It's those who are looking, one group looks down upon another. The other group is being persecuted by the other. Division in the family. So what does John emphasize? As always John emphasized, love. You've missed it. It's just about love. Love God. Love your fellow man. Because if you loved your fellow man, you wouldn't be treating him the way the false teachers are treating the members of the church. So with those themes in mind, um, yes, there were homilies. Yeah, I went to preaching school. Great for me. Um, but in general, picture yourself as the first century church. Division has come in because of this false teaching. And here's the good news. We have a letter. We have a letter from the Apostle John. And it's very possible this letter might have circulated like John's letters, uh, the Revelation, circulated along that that little circle in Asia Minor. Listen, as the letter would have been written to that first century church. <clears throat> that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, 
I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write to you children, excuse me, I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven. Oh, I'm going to try that again. I'm, I'm seeing the prose and I'm, I'm trying to think of it in the song and I can't do that. I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest, that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him 
there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandment abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him 
and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, We know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin and there is sin not leading to death. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, In his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen.
the repetition in that letter, the, the pounding of that same message over and over. You know, we know, we know. We're not in doubt. We don't misunderstand. We know. And the fact is, God sent Jesus to come into this world to be the propitiation for our sins, to pay the price for our sins, and we know that. We also know that by faith we access that grace, and thus anyone who would be Christ's must live as Christ lived. Anyone who would be God's must listen and believe what God said. And he said, this is my son, hear ye him. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. That's what he said, if you would be God's, then you must believe it. Brethren, love one another. This division and fighting and bickering within the body is not of God. It is of the devil. And he gave Cain and Abel as an example. We need to seek peace in the faith. And we need to love one another because it is commanded of us in our faith. Now, brethren, we know we grown-ups in the Lord. We know that sometimes that loving one another is difficult. Meaning, we have to have difficult conversations. We have to get into each other's businesses at times. But brethren, I keep asking, are we the family of God in truth or is it just a figure of speech? I don't think it's a figure of speech. I think it's in truth. And I get in all my family's business. The reason is, my family is my business, and I love them. And you remember, I seek that love which is their best. That's why we get involved. That's why we have those difficult conversations. Let us never stop and shy away, because as soon as we stop shying away, we're not loving our brethren, and we are commanded to do so. Abiding in the truth. How often do we hear some new movement in the so-called Christian world? What's new with this nearly 2,000-year-old book? And over half of it, way more than 2,000 years old. It's nothing new. There may be people who haven't understood it for a long time, and they want to say suddenly, oh, do you know that we're supposed to love one another? Really? I see that in the very beginning, when God said, let us create man in our own image. What's that? That's love. We have this truth declared once for all, and we simply must abide. I say simply. It can be difficult because that winds of doctrine, right, that are always trying to move us aside, we have to focus, like John did, on what we know. And be not moved. I love that psalm. I will not be moved. We have the truth. We are established. We have no need to fear. Notice how he mentioned that too. You don't even have to be afraid because the perfect love of God and the love we're supposed to have one another casts out fear. You need not be afraid. Therefore, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. The Apostle Paul wrote, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. False doctrines, Gnosticism. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you see how that encapsulates everything that John wrote. There's the truth. There's the war that we're engaged in. Not a physical war, but a war of, of false teachers and false doctrines against the truth we have clearly revealed. And our striving is to abide in Christ so that even every thought is brought into captivity to Christ. And if we are obedient, we will punish disobedience and deal with false teachers. Therefore, Paul also wrote 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. Speaking of Timothy, he said that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, 
for every good work. What did John say in his letter? You know. John, help us. What do we need? You don't need anything. You have it. Abide in it. Strive for it. Live it. And you will overcome. Such a simple message. John is such an excellent writer. So simple. Simplistic in his language. And yet, as it's been said, maybe no one saw deeper into the, the heart of God than John. If you're not a Christian this evening, the truth of God's word is that he desires more than anything that you would be saved. He has provided the means for you to be free of your sin. And the question is, will you accept his grace and access it by the faith? The faith says you must hear of God and his plan, of your trouble with sin and his solution through his son. You must believe it, that it is from him and that it is in fact true. You must repent of your sin. It must break your heart with that godly sorrow that that being that created you and did everything for you, you rebelled against him, causing problems in your life and in the lives of those around you. You must repent and change your mind. No longer you in charge, but God, your loving creator in charge. You must confess the fact that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the son of the living God. God in the flesh. And then you submit to his will. And his will is that you be baptized for the remission of sin, rise from that water to newness of life, to then begin a life of walking in the light, pursuing his righteousness. If you've never done that, why not this evening? Christians, that long walk from baptism to the grave, from cleansing to reward, it's a long walk filled with distractions, filled with pressure to get us to move away. The question is, like John was encouraging, will we abide? Will we be content with, God, with what God has given us and what he holds in store for us? Or will the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life lead us foolishly into darkness? Pray it's not so. If you've been that led that way, as we talk, today is the day of salvation. Brethren, I have good news. It's always the day of salvation because it's always today. As the great theologian O. Osborne said, you know, today, yesterday, today, no. Today was, today was tomorrow, yesterday. Yes. <laughs> today was tomorrow, yesterday. It's always today. So it's always the day of salvation. Now is the time when you can turn back. We don't know about tomorrow. We don't know if it's going to be. So take advantage now. If there's anything we can do to help you, to get back where you need to be, or to help you in any way, we'd ask that you come forward as together we stand and sing.